Yeah, next talk for today, um, Marc Prier, um, he wants to introduce you some things about um, um, op the open source network tester and will present you some uh, research he did with the uh, NetFPGA uh, 10 gig. Uh, so, nice warm welcome for Marc Prier. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, then, um, as he introduced me, then just uh, I'm going to talk about uh, open source uh, uh, network tester based on the NetFPGA 10 gig. Gianni uh, Antiki, um, who is the, the, the guy who uh, coded the, the part for the capturing part, is not here today, but. Uh, um, if you want, you can contact him by this email. Um, I'm going to talk about the NetFPGA 10 gig, NetFPGA, what it is, and there's a different version of uh, this board uh, we've been using for that project. And we're going to go through the architecture and uh, different parts of the OSNT, Open Source Network Tester, or the generation part and the monitoring part and the hybrid part with we joined the two different projects in one uh, a bit fine for the FPGA. And uh, a framework we've been using for uh, research parts and uh, different one other use case I'm going to show uh, that we've been using for testing um, FNS switches. Um, computer networking is obviously something we use every time, every day, and need to be tested. Um, we can test by software to software, but when you want to test high performance switches, you need a hardware. You need a, a, a hardware who is able to uh, keep up uh, in terms of uh, line rate for uh, testing hardware to hardware uh, environment for network. Um, then there is a lot of data you need to generate, and it's only uh, through FPGA and uh, or network processor that with FPGA, you get a, a better uh, timing uh, than you cannot get on the even on NPU network processor unit. Well, one thing about networking is uh, there is a lot of protocols. There is a lot of uh, different standards. And if we talk about low levels, Aussie levels, then we talk about a lot, a lot of different um, protocols who are actually need to be implemented. And there is standard groups, IEEE, uh, there are IFC from EATF and so on. If you need to follow this, it's, it's very difficult and every time it needs to be implemented by a vendor company, then this is difficult. And this is why that it come up with a, a teaching platform, the native PGA, then you're able to, to do your own implementations. Uh, the native PGA is um, been uh, designed at Stanford for the first generation uh, with the help on the 10 gig with uh, Cambridge University in UK. There's different applications the, then you can do your own uh, NIC card um, and hardware accelerated Linux router then you use uh, the FPGA uh, to um, to do the, the forwarding part uh, and being controlled by the whole system where the, the native PGA is. And um, the reference router, traffic generation, uh, open flow switches, and more, much more projects. It's around, if you go on the nativepga.org website, you will find about 30 different projects with all open source. Then you get in 2007, that was the NetFPGA uh, one gig board. It was a uh, 4 one gig uh, with a Virtex, with uh, uh, these different memories, and the Spartan was taking care of the PCI connections. Then um, the 
project native PGA is for different things. Then we get obviously the board itself, the, the tools and the reference design that uh, students and uh, hackers can use to do their own project. And uh, the contributed project, that's the one we can find on the netfpga.org website and the community itself. Then after the, the one gig version, um, it's been designed the, the 10 gig to be able, obviously, to follow with the performances we get on the FNS switches today. Uh, it's four poor 10 gig, and it's uh, state of the heart technology at that time. It's been designed a few years ago already. And uh, then we go for SFP cages, when you can place different uh, SFP, SFP plus uh, transceivers. And you can have direct attached copper, copper uh, cable, or you can, uh, you can plug uh, different uh, optical fiber transceivers for 10 gig or 1 gig. Um, on the board itself, then we, we have a, a SRAM, where actually um, for placing the different uh, storing routing tables or CAM or different information you want to you want, uh, have on very high speed connections. And uh, there is a DRAM uh, also for being able to uh, buffer some, some part of the things you want to uh, uh, trick. And the PCI Express um, connectors is the endpoint and the difference of the one gig is directly on the, on the Vertex itself. And you have an extension slot uh, will allow to get uh, the different GTX uh, transceivers, then uh, to extend the, the connections of the FPGA itself. If you want to use the different port and connect out of the board, uh, different um, uh, channel for being able to, to get in and out without passing through the, the PCI is possible through the extension slot. Um, it's, it's all optimized, obviously, for being able to uh, keep up on uh, 40 gig, full time 10 gig. Then it's, we're not losing any packets with this design. And um, what is about is obviously when we talk about the different protocols implementations today, uh, there is different uh, vendors, all commercial. Uh, they they sell uh, their licenses and it's uh, uh, pretty expensive. And, um, and obviously, um, they have different functionality for different type of interfaces in terms of uh, networks. We, we focus on the main, main one uses Ethernet. Uh, but we have the same capacity of uh, those vendors in terms of hardware. And, uh, the main differences for us is being able to um, put your hands onto the code, and uh, it's, uh, it costs a lot if you want to go for um, a commercial implementation. Just to get a couple of uh, 10 gig ports, it will cost you 25,000 dollar box uh, easily. Uh, just to get the license on the software to need to, need to run the hardware part on the FPGA you have on the XCR, for example, uh, implementation for 2 port 10 gig. Those equipment are very dedicated for testing um, clusters, for example, when you want to run uh, high performance testing onto a cluster of server, or uh, more precisely to test if you want to test you just a new design of your new switch Ethernet then you need, you need to get those uh, capacity. It's a very small market and a long development cycle for those guys. But um, Then it come up for us to, um, why not try to do on the native PGA, um, or SNT, Open Source Network Tester, to be able to do the same um, things that XCI is doing, for example, with a reference. Um, then to have a low cost and uh, open source approach. We won't talk about open source. We talk also open source on the, on the PCB itself. Then you can have access when you register on the, on the GitHub we have. 
And as is dedicated for research and, uh, and teaching community, it's also used in different universities, not only Stanford and Cambridge, but a lot of us, um, for teaching how to make a harder um, reading or switch uh, based equipment. Then you need, you need a yeah, PCI like this. Um, we started last year in June um, the project and the, the kickoff was in the middle of June uh, last year. Then we designed at that time on paper what we wanted to do, and um, we had uh, to work on, on the generation part and the, the monitor, monitoring part, all separated. Um, Shabbat was uh, from Georgia Tech, he was um, uh, developing the generation part, and the monitoring part was being done by uh, Jenny. And uh, Elong uh, was doing the interfaces and, and so on. I was doing more the testing and following the project. And Adam Covington was uh, the guy from Stanford who helped us to interface everything as well. Um, then, architecture part, and I just mentioned the different two parts of the traffic generation part. Uh, the traffic generation part is uh, being able to uh, run on line rate on, on the 10 gig port and uh, obviously to test, as mentioned, for the small market and do the same thing. Um, the monitoring part is being able to, um, uh, on design, to um, capture packets, timestamp or uh, filter some packets out of the, the pipe of 10 gig. Uh, and uh, cut or ash at the, the packets. The hybrid is uh, actually the join of the two uh, projects, and we're going to look into the details uh, after this. And we approach, uh, we try and design to be able to um, bring more uh, um, modules. Uh, after this and be able to implement uh, OSNT on different platforms and not only on the native PGA because the, the software part we have on the host system where the PCI and native PGA is, in, is plugged uh, could be used on different other platforms. Then we're going to look into the, um, the generation part. Um, on the first stage of the uh, design, we decided to do a pickup replay. And also, in, in the same time, uh, try to obviously, in the code we implemented on the traffic generation part, to get micro engines to be able to uh, uh, run um, traffic models and the different uh, headers being implemented to be able to generate directly from the FPGA uh, the traffic. The pickup replay was the easiest way we thought at the beginning. Obviously, we had some problems to implement it, but uh, now it's running. And um, on the, um, the different capacity we have is not only what packets we need to generate, but we need to also um, the packet size and the inter-packet delay for uh, tricking the, the uh, data rate. Uh, we want to generate because we don't want all the time to get uh, the line rate, 100% of 10 gig. We may want different interframe gap, uh, or slower uh, packet rate. The architecture, then if you look into details, um, then um, uh, the, the gray boxes represent the ongoing work, and uh, this part, the time stamping on the packet how it generated is now implemented. That wasn't the case when we made that slide. Then the, the delay module and the rate limiters are uh, guaranteed output and uh, that the user uh, wants. And um, uh, the 25 SRAM is used to store the packet. Then on the, we're talking here for uh, the pickup replay. Then obviously the pickup we use when we talk about pickup is uh, like uh, 
is the, si the, the, the file that we get from a TCP dump or Wireshark, then you can reuse it, you just capture traffic, and you can reuse it, or obviously you can get that pickup as well from the OSNT itself and replay uh, the traffic you just capture. And is the amount of, uh, of data you're able to regenerate, then you will loop uh, around the 27 megabyte of SRAM. Um, then the micro engines we're still working on is they're here. Then obviously is the uh, interface to be able to um, uh, say exactly you want, a, for example, a UDP packet with this IP. Just generate from here and not uh, like we do today. A pickup relay engine is will be generated directly uh, by the micro engines, and then it could be different type of protocols in the same time going into the pipeline out. And um, it's, uh, it's ongoing. Uh, statistics collectors, it's just obviously how many packets being sent and what type of packets and information like this. Um, the um, time stamping on out, then there's the, it helps obviously when you want to test the latency uh, along a data path when you're sending a packet with a timestamp in. Uh, you know when it's been sent, then you can capture the same packets and obviously compare the two timestamp. And uh, to be sure you, you, you get the, the right packet, this is a lot of packets uh, going out in the same time, uh, you can compare by signature. Um, then we had to decide the way we're going to do the, the time stamping. It was a very important, and that's one of the reasons I joined that project as part of my uh, PhD, uh, to um, uh, measure latency in an in a open flow environment. Um, and uh, there is two ways to think of the implementation. Or you use um, a free run counter directly, uh, driven by the, the clock itself, but the clock of uh, a board like this will drift when you need that uh, nanoseconds precision. Then we decided to use the direct digital synthesis, which is actually uh, who needs um, a GPS uh, synchronizations or whatever other synchronizations or one one PPS today. Uh, one packet per second, high precisions all the time, and he, he slowed down a little bit uh, the counter, or he accelerated just to obviously keep keep the uh, the synchronizations and uh, avoid the drift we have uh, based on temperature change we have on the clock and some other things like this who may happen. Then uh, we've done some measure on the native PGA uh, a few time back. And uh, we, we've seen that even the, the drift we have here on that, on that clock was a little bit worse than the, a normal a swatch. Uh, that's why we implemented DDS. And the interface, we, we, we use Python, um, and uh, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, um, it's all we need, obviously, to be able to um, generate traffic. Then we select per pole, the different uh, the four pole we have, the pickup we want to uh, run, and uh, um, the number of time, and uh, um, yeah, the different information where it's placed on the ESRAM, just for debugging. And the rate limiter side, uh, just obviously what the speed you want to have of these interfaces, and you call also for inter-packet delay, if you want to use the, the timestamp, where is the time of the pickup itself, then to generate exactly the, the timing that the, the capturing uh, traffic you had will be replayed, or you can, you, you can do your own timing, will be obviously the same because we have one input only for delay register. And um, that's almost it, just to be able for the first functions for the pickup replay to be able to uh, replay all the time the same traffic we could be generated by different interfaces or a live traffic. Um, during the testing, then um, we, we could on, on one, one pole at the just beginning um, against an XCR uh, to uh, uh, measure the, the traffic generated, uh, but 
We implement it for the second port because we need to integrate different uh, blocks of RAMs allocated into SRAM. Then as is today, then we, have a, we are really able to run full line rate on two ports. When you get a third port, it will, it will be a little bit less than uh, 30 gig as expected. And obviously when you get four, it gets less as well. Then we need to implement more blocks into the SRAM. That's an effort we are doing today to be able to uh, run uh, 40 gig line rate. Um, and um, uh, the 96 bit is the interframe gap we cannot change because the, we use the, the MAC fee uh, was generating the end of the, uh, the, the flow. And the only things we can increase, obviously, the interframe gap, we cannot go uh, below 96 bit of, uh, of space between two packets when we send uh, the packets on the, on the fiber or the copper. Um, that's one difference we have on the commercial uh, implementation. They can go uh, smaller, different gap. Then on the more direct part, um, here obviously is to be able to capture as much as possible on the on the on the pole. Uh, then we can we can choose by uh, filter rules. We have uh, five tuples with classically uh, source and destination, MAC address, and uh, IP, and uh, the TCP port, UDP or TCP port. That's a classical five tuples. Here, then you have to think that this is very easy here uh, to implement other uh, filtering rules. Uh, then because we can just modify the the code to be able to uh, to go. On even on payloads, if you want to match on a particular uh, pattern on the payload, um, then we we worked on to getting on on the high precisions on the um, time stamping because it's a part of uh, uh, the the reason of OSNT um, and the, the time stamping we're going to see on the architecture. Uh, uh, where it's done and how it's done. Then the, the different statistics we get, we're going to look into the interfaces. There is some other statistics we can get uh, from, uh, from the card, but on the, on the GUI we made with just the simple ones. Um, then we received on the FOPO 10 gig here just uh, on the top, and right after we received the packets, and they, they are uh, check because we have on our Ethernet header. We have at the end of uh, of the Ethernet header, we have a, a CRC to to check if the packet is uh, is a good packet. When this is done at that level, we just timestamp, and it's timestamp is actually next to the to the normal pipe where the packets get in uh, to uh, to to avoid any any effect of uh, buffering we can get to be able to timestamp very high, in high, very high precisions when the packet get in, you really timestamp time it. Um, then we have um, the static st collectors, we give us different uh, uh, information to the Linux box. Uh, the header extractions and TCAM and decision modules, where we uh, do the filtering stage and packet FIFO to uh, send out, and obviously the decision module say, okay, based on the filter, I have just cut that packet and send on the PCI uh, to the whole system and uh, do a hash if necessary. Um, then one thing, so obviously we, we, we work on one uh, protocol as uh, uh, .1Q to be able to, to, to get the VLAN numbers as well, because it's, uh, in networking today, uh, VLANs are spread uh, a lot. Um, then, uh, obviously, yeah, just uh, the same information. We go to the, the GUI itself. Um, the, the different port, uh, the, the packet counter, the VLAN packet counter, if it's an IP packet, UDP or TCP, and the, the packet rates or bit rates. Um, here are the filter rules. Then everything is uh, need to be loaded and modified through the, the console by a, a file with uh, 
loaded separately uh, from the GUI. And uh, the cutter and timer, then the timer is the, the, when the application has been run, you can reset it just for information. And uh, the cut length, if you implement it cut, if you need to cut just a few bytes from the beginning of the packet. You want the, the first 128 uh, bytes of a packet, then it, it will, uh, for example, show here. And a console log to give you the different um, actions you made on the GUI. Um, this application um, where the GUI is connected is C-based. And um, we generate, um, based on the filter, a normal pickup or new generation pickup. There's a slight difference, especially for new generations. It allows uh, nanoseconds uh, by default on the pickup NG. Then what we've done to be able to use the normal pickup, I mean the, the default pickup file, uh, we uh, patched uh, to get uh, nanosecond precisions into the, the pickup. Um, and uh, you're also able to use a CLI, a command base, uh, um, to be able to uh, script outside of the GUI, uh, the application. Then we moved the different project in, into uh, the hybrid, was actually uh, the generation and the monitoring were uh, bring together into the FPGA. Um, it took us quite some time to be able to do it. No, in terms of effort, but on, on calculating, on letting calculating for the routing to be able to to get the two projects on the FPGA, and this approach led us to uh, get different pipeline. If you want other pipeline in the same time to be implemented, and um, now let's use it. Uh, when when. Uh, we have a switch uh, with a 48 uh, 10 gig pole, for example. Then um, it's difficult to get um, a big tester with itself 48 10 gig pole to connect directly in, in all the pole to each other's. Then what we can do with uh, OSNT or other is, uh, if you want to just test the, the performance of uh, all the pole, use the stack test. The stack test. You use, you configure two ports in the same VLAN, and uh, then you generate a layer two with one MAC address, with the same one, and it will go through the different port one by one, getting in and out uh, along the, the 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 cabling you're gonna you're gonna place uh, to test the 48 10 gig port, but for you, you're just using one port to generate the traffic, another one to receive it, and, and in opposite way as well. Then you can test on full duplex with only two port 10 gig. Uh, whatever number of, uh, of port you have on the switch you want to test. This is uh, pretty useful if you want to test on layer, layer two only uh, switches. If you want to test for routing layer three, um, then you need VRF, you need different uh, another approach to configure, prepare uh, the different ball. Um, one project we used uh, OSNT is uh, in software-defined networking. Is uh, change in the networking today is to separate the control plane, with uh, taking care of controlling the network, where is who is connected who. Uh, which subnet you can reach, like OSPF, BGP, the different uh, routing protocols, for example, um, are actually getting separated, and that control is getting out from the closed boxes, from the switch either router we have today. And OpenFlow is one protocol who uh, were able to control the OpenFlow switches while doing the, the forwarding uh, and maintaining the, the data plane, the data path. Then we use OSNT uh, to be able to uh, test a uh, new OpenFlow uh, implementation we have today. Uh, we, we change um, the, with the OpenFlow request on the switch um, to say, for example, just change a flow and uh, how much time, then we, we measure the time, it will get the switch to uh, do that actions. Um, 
in the open floor implementation and design we have today, this information is very critical. When you have a lot of flow, we need to be modified. And then obviously we have different, different testing scenarios we use to be able to um, see the limitations of uh, next generation open flow switches using the OSNT. Uh, this all the guys uh, who've been participating to the project uh, from between Stanford, Cambridge, uh, Georgia Tech, and other university. And uh, I invite you to join and get a look into the OSNT.org. There is a video uh, who uh, show you uh, our running is the, the project, and you can join the GitHub and the, the different uh, uh, mailing list. Thanks. Okay, we have some time for questions now. Any questions in the audience? Hi. Um, I'm, I'm more... Uh, Curious about how the timestamping was uh, implemented, um, and um, was it just a, a, a variable speed count, count counter with a phase detector on the on the one uh, PPS input, or uh, was it done uh, differently? Uh, just by the DDS, and it's the the, can, the counter just. Uh, you, when you, you saw the, the, the time reference we had on a GUI, then you can reset it, then it will use that, that counter. Then, uh, then this is actually showing the, the counter itself. Uh, and obviously 6.25 nanoseconds is, is the, uh, any increment in the, in, the, in the counter itself on the FPGA represents 6.25 uh, uh, nanoseconds. Then DDS. Right, to, to keep, obviously, the reference time uh, on U UTC time using the GPS uh, to correlate with, with that counter, to accelerate it or slow it down uh, to uh, stay around the GPS input. Okay, any more questions? Okay, fine. Thanks, uh, Mark, Thank for, you. for your interesting talk and uh, your um, a happy uh, applaud for, for Mark. Thank you.